Welcome back to Unleash Success. This is your host, Corey Corpodian. Guys, a quick update on the podcast. We're going to be releasing episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays now. On Mondays, we're still going to do the Mental Mondays to create a mental shift to help you become more successful during the week. Wednesdays, we'll be interviewing people just like we have been for the last two plus years. You know, people have built million or even billion dollar businesses. And then on Fridays, a new series that I'm introducing called Everyday Entrepreneurs. This is to break down the secrets of people that are in the in the dirt. You know, they're they're working on their strategies of success. They're trying things today to show you what it takes to make a thousand dollars more a month, or maybe even ten thousand dollars more a month, and leave your day job. If you are interested in building a business, if you want to grow a new business that you just started, I created a free guide. Go to unleashsuccess.com slash startup. It's a free guide compiling all the best advice that I got from the last two years of interviewing successful entrepreneurs on the podcast. So if you want to start a business or grow your new business, go to unleashsuccess.com slash startup and the link will be in the show notes. to the Unleash Success Podcast, where we break down the secrets of success to give you real tools and strategies that get real results. And now, here's your host, Corey Korpodian. Welcome back to Unleash Success. This is your host, Corey Korpodian. Today, we're interviewing Jen Hickel, who's a business coach for creatives. She owns the business uh, Rogers School of Music outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and also the Never Alone Business Service, which is a business consulting firm for creatives. Uh, As a mom of four kids, she's been able to take her side business to six figures. And today, she's going to help break down what her secrets to success are in today's show. Jen, thanks so much for coming on. Hi, thanks for having me. So I want to get started with, you know, you started this as kind of your side business, side hustle. Um, Were you working at the time or were you just taking care of your kids? So I graduated from college. um, I was married halfway through and I was already pregnant. So I didn't even like launch into a career. I just had always been teaching piano lessons and hiring teachers um, even while I was in college. So I kind of started my business in college, but I um, went straight into motherhood. Um, So... Then as the years went on of having babies, I was like, we got to get out of this apartment. And my husband's like, we'll get more students, you know, and then we got a townhouse and I was like, I really need a bigger house. He's like, get more students. So it was sort of like this need, like I had to grow my thing just to help me be a mom. But it was always something I couldn't see not being an entrepreneur. I couldn't see myself, um, you know, not to put anyone down out there, but I couldn't just be a mom. Like I have so much energy inside of me. I had to be doing um, this thing, growing this business the whole time I was having babies. And then after I had my fourth, I was like, you know what? It's time to take this to the next level. I got to do more. I am tired of clipping coupons. I am tired of living like this. I mean, we were on a government as- assistance. We were, I mean, I was buying like the meat that was ready to expire at the grocery store. Like that was my meat for the week. And I was like, there's got to be a better way here. So that's really my motivation. Um, so it was, it was a side business, meaning it was very small, but I then grew it to be our family's entire income. Wow, that's incredible. And you must have a lot of energy. I, mean, <laughs> I, I don't have kids yet, but every time I see anybody with a toddler running around, yep. they're always so exhausted. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I, I'd have to ask, you know, how did you balance <laughs> raising kids with running a business? Oh, Where do you find the time? Yeah, that is the number <laughs> one question I get. And first of all, I always tell people balance is impossible. <laughs> balance implies perfection, right? So when you look at the Olympics and these gymnasts on a balance beam, they will sometimes fall off from a simple turn. So balance is really, really hard. What I like to look at it more as as juggling. So you give some momentum to a certain area. So my kids are going back to school. Like you give a lot of momentum to that school. And I forgot to tell you, I homeschool them too. So they don't actually go to school. They're always here. (laughs) So we get that rolling and then I can give attention to my business, right? Or something's coming up or I need to hire a new staff person or something. I can give all my momentum, all my energy. And I try to keep those balls in the air. Of course I drop them. 
you can't be perfect, but it's like, what needs my energy? What needs my attention at this moment? That's really how, um, I've been able to do all this and also lots of systems, like lots of organization. Now I am a creative, I'm a writer, I'm a musician. Um, I like to fly by the seat of my pants sometimes, you know, I do not do boring. I do not do like accountant bookkeeper type <laughs> life. Um, but I still have lots of systems. So lots of checklists, lots of things to keep the whole thing rolling. Um, I don't want all my time and attention to be the house, the food, the kids, because it's really kind of repetitive. But if I can get that systematized, then I can do my energy towards growing my business and expanding and scaling and growing. And so I think that's the secret. Um, and because people ask me this question so much, I wrote a book. So it's not real long. It's like a one evening, probably maybe a couple nights. It's called Happy Kids Growing Biz. And it's just a lot of this stuff. Like, how do you balance it all? How do you juggle it all? So if your listeners are like, how on earth am I going to have kids? Honestly, the more crazy I got, the more I had to learn time management, to be honest, because you don't learn time management when you have a lot of time. You learn time management when you're short on time. So I had to get so strategic. Like at times I was growing my business just at nap time or after the kids went to bed. I had to sneak it in. I had to be really strategic and use tools, you know, my phone. My Apple Watch, like I could not do it without technology, to be honest. Um, I could be at the park, get the kids playing, emails on the phone, right? Like that's just, we live in such an awesome time to be able to do that. It is a, it is a very interesting time. And, and, you know, how do you stay present though mm. in the moment yeah. when you're always so connected to different types of technology mm -hmm. that... I mean, the amount of emails I get on a daily basis yeah. is insane. Yeah. And I can't, I, I actually, I turn it off. Like I yep. only reload my emails when I yep. go in to check it. Because if not, it's too distracting. That's right. that's right. Well, that's exactly, I mean, that's such a good strategy is being aware of like, where am I present right now? Because it's very important for me to be present and connected with my kids. And so I'm very in tune. Like you say, I'm making dinner or something. And I look around and like all four kids are not there. Okay, great. Well, let's listen to a podcast. Let's, you know, um, you know, I'm stirring something or boiling water, check my email quick. And so I'm always like grabbing these little moments when I can not doing all things at all times, but just being very aware of like who needs me, what needs to happen. And then what I really believe in, especially for creatives is you need a buffer. You need a VA, you need somebody illogical. So when I work with creatives, I always say you need a left brain buddy, somebody else that's going to take those emails, the tasks, the repetitive stuff, like don't even waste your time doing it. Make sure you've got someone else. So really one of my best tips is outsource early. Focus on your strengths. What can only you do and what do you do best? Because when you do it best, you're going to do it the fastest. It's going to be the easiest for you. You're going to, it's not going to take very long. So, um, back when I was growing my business, um, when I really got serious about it, I started launching beyond music lessons. We also started a whole theater program and I was using a lot of Excel spreadsheets. I was calculating a lot of things, figuring out the numbers. And there were things I was doing that were taking me like three hours and I wanted to bang my head against the wall. I was so frustrated. I was literally angry. I was like, I can't figure this out. And my husband would come home from work and he's like, oh, I got that. You know, and 10 seconds later, he'd fix that Excel, you know, whatever they're called formulas. And I was like, what? Why? Why could you do that so fast? And it taught me very early on, don't waste your time doing things that frustrate you and make you angry. And I, I'm impatient, right? I want it done now. I want to just figure it out. But it's not worth it when I can just go, you know what? I'm going to hand that to my left brain buddy or my VA or whoever it is that's wired for that stuff. And I'm going to put my time where only I can be. So that's a huge, huge takeaway. You know, a lot of people tell me, Jen, I can't afford to hire. Are you kidding me? You can't afford not to. Because if you would get some of those tasks, those emails, those things off your plate, somebody else was dedicated to doing it. How much more money could you make in that time? Right. right. So really uh, systems outsourcing, delegating, automating, you know, those are the things I talk about in my book. That has been the biggest key takeaway for me to be able to do everything that I do. 
Fantastic. And, and specifically for outsourcing uh, and VA, is there a service that you use to be able to find somebody that was reliable? How'd you find your I've account? looked into a lot of services. I know there's great ones out there. For me personally, I tend to know them in real life. And then they want to be able to have the flexibility working from home. Again, we utilize Slack, technology, emails, you know, different things so that they can. I love giving them the freedom that like, just get it done on your own time. I don't want to micromanage them because how can you from somebody else working at home? You don't know. So you have to be able to be outcome based, right? You have to be able to inspect what you expect and by the outcome. So I don't care how many hours it took them. You know, I, I tend to just buy them on like a chunk. Like I'll be like, I just want to contract you for 10 hours a week. Here are the things I need you to do. Let me know if you have more time. And that's worked really well, but knowing them in real life first helps build that trust. So, um, at my music school, like I had one gal who worked with me for like four or five years, the front desk loved her. She had her third or second baby. She was like, I I'm out. I got to be at home with my kids. I'm like, all right, will you be a VA for me? You know, I, you already know me. You already trust me. You know, I trust you. Um, let's just hook up this technology. And she has been such a wonderful asset. So I'm sure there's great things out there, but sometimes it's like, just look around who, do you know, you know, who can, yeah. who can take some of that stuff off your plate? It was interesting what you said, though, though. Do you pay people by the hour or do you pay them for a specific task? So I pay um, on a retainer. So it's they a lot of VAs will like to know that they have our set aside for you and your company. So they might pick up three clients. Right. And maybe each client gets 10 hours. They track their hours but they know that they're going to get a set amount from me. I have found better loyalty that way. The other problem with entrepreneurs is we don't like to outsource. We want to just do it. It feels faster. It feels like by the time I go tell them what to do, I could have just done it. Right? So these, so when you are forcing yourself to pay that chunk, you're like, I better use it. So it shifts the mentality and actually forces you to delegate and get it off your plate when you know you're going to pay them regardless. So you better get, those tasks together to, to delegate to them, to get to them. Um, we use things like todoist.com where it's recurring tasks. So I love for VAs to give them recurring things, not what just comes up because of the tasks that come up in my week, it's like, Oh, I could give that to a VA. Again, that's when my brain says, "Never mind, I'll just do it quick. But the things that right. need to be done every single week. So I'll give you an example. I write a blog, then my VAs will pull out quotes, create graphics, post them on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. I don't have to manage that. Now I've just started even saying, let me see the graphics. I'm going to approve them for a while. I didn't even approve them because sometimes you just got to move fast, you know, but every once in a while something would be posted. I was like, eh, you know, didn't quite match my brand or something. So now we're tightening up a little bit, but even then they just send it over Slack. I look it over, looks great, approved, but it's just recurring. So you have a couple VAs. I do. And and what's what's the average cost for a VA per hour? I would say the more expensive, the better the VA. <laughs> so you want to <laughs> pay between twenty and thirty an hour or more, you know, because then the higher they are, the more specialized they are. So I have VAs who are specialized in Facebook, or we've got a VA who helps with bookkeeping clients, or a VA who helps with Google Ads clients. Um, and then, so if it's just more admin tasks, you know, a little simpler, it can be lower, but even my one VA who's creating graphics, like she has to be good at that. So don't skimp on it because then I think you're back to banging your head against the wall because now you're having to correct things and you're having to explain things. So it would be better to go with somebody who has some experience or is very willing to learn because it needs to be on them. You really shouldn't pay them. Uh, you shouldn't be paying them while you're teaching them. I would say right. it's better if they come to you saying, you know what, I've been doing these tasks. I'm really good at this. Can I take that off your plate? They should, you should have an idea of what you want done. So another thing that I always tell my creatives is first start with what you're already doing and outsource that because there is a sense of fear and panic when you say, you know, I really need to have a presence on LinkedIn. I know nothing about it. I'm going to hire somebody to do it. Okay, well, now you have no clue if the outcome is actually what you want because you have no experience with it. So start with something that you're like, I've been uploading my videos to YouTube, marking them as unlisted, posting them here. This is dumb. I don't need to do this. Put it to a VA. You already know the process. So you can inspect what you expect because you've been doing it. So that's my first tip is always start with what you're already doing. 
later you can like have a strategy. It's like, okay, this person's a LinkedIn expert, you know, here are the results that I'm looking for. And then you can again, look at the outcome. So it has to be outcome based for us to know, like, was it worth our money? If you just don't know what they're doing, then you might as well just go take your money and flush it down the drain, right? You have to have a way, a right. metric to know that's getting me clients or that's actually working because a lot of time and energy can be wasted on these social media platforms and you just think you're getting out there and maybe it's not growing your company. <laughs> so, and, and that's exactly the problem too, is that, you know, for people who are just starting out, they're throwing money at ads and they're not getting any results. Yeah. Um, and so you have to have somebody to help you out. So, what, what are some strategies you use to be able to build a business that, I mean, literally supports your family? I mean, this is this is the American dream. <laughs> yeah, it right? is. It's like, it's like you're living it. Yeah. You've got kids. You're, you're, you're able to come on this podcast. You're able to take care of your kids. Homeschool them too, which, by the way, I couldn't believe you said that. Uh, <laughs> but what, what's what been the secret to, to getting that much growth and, and constantly mm-hmm. getting out there to get new clients? The secret is solving a problem. A business is simply meeting a need, solving a problem that people are willing to pay for. So what I have done my whole life is scanned for what do people want? What do they need? And so when my neighbor said, will you teach my kid piano lessons? I was like, um, like, I don't even know if I'm good enough. I mean, I took piano all these years. I was going to go get a music degree. So I went to my piano teacher and I'm like, can I teach? He's like, yeah, you can totally. And thank God for that moment that he believed in me right? Because I was like, let's do it. Well, then pretty soon the next neighbor wants piano lessons. The next neighbor wants piano lessons. I'm going, hmm, we've got a need here. Parents value this. Let's do it. Then people came to me. Do you teach guitar? Why? No, I don't. But I can find a guitar teacher. Became in demand. So we added guitar, then voice, later violin drums, you know. Um, So it's always finding the need and then meeting it. And then as we grew the consulting and marketing company, same thing. Like I notice all these creatives banging their head against the wall with more techie things. I can do that for you. And we specifically build websites that we give you the keys back. So we are not holding your website hostage. You can still edit it. You can still go in there. Creatives want to be able to touch it. They want to move it around. They want to be able to blog. But they want to come to us when they're like, I can't figure this out. So again, it's meeting a need. Um, I think a lot of us, We have this idea of what we want to do. You know, I was like, I want to be a business coach. Okay. But what's the need? Because I don't actually get to do what I want to do. I have to serve. I have to solve a problem. That's when people pay me. So I've just kept scaling and growing our business and adding streams of income by being attentive to what are the needs out there and how can I solve them? So interesting too. You said like, you know, as a business coach, what are you solving? Yeah. And it is so interesting because, you know, there's it, the coaching industry is very, you know, widespread, yes. lots of different people in it. Some are extremely valuable and others not so much. And you're not really clear on the message. Um, it was, it's interesting. Like, how did you get into being a business coach for creative specifically? Where mm-hmm. where did you see that come in? What was the motivation for that? Well, I was in a group of all music school owners. And so they were – you just naturally, usually, if you own a music school, you're more on the creative side. You know, you might have a husband and wife team. Like, my husband isn't a musician. He would not say he's a creative. I think all of us have a creative streak, okay? We are all, like, made to create something. But when I say creatives, I mean – artists, musicians, duct taping it together, going as fast as they can, um, flying by the seat of their pants and Myers-Briggs, they're often peas, you know, they're often feelers. They, you know, have a big heart. Um, and I discovered right away that I had a connection with them and I got them cause I'm kind of a bridge. I'm kind of weird. Like I'm like half techie and half super creative. So I find myself in the middle and I found myself really easily being able to relate to them and also saying like, Hey, my husband, Chris helps me. You need a Chris. And so I kind of started selling him to be honest. I was like, I can relate to you because I'm a creative like you are and I don't want to do that stuff. Why don't you buy these services from my husband? So it was a very natural bridge. As I got into more and more business um, coaching groups and just hanging out with entrepreneurs, um, there's something called a Colby. Have you ever heard of that? K-O-L-B-E. Okay. It's an awesome assessment. And what it tells you is how the, the high, the first number is 
fact finding. So what, what number, what level are you on a scale of one to nine on wanting those facts and those details? And then the second column is follow through. And it's not actually what we think of as follow through, but it's meaning systems. So pursuing systems, doing the same thing every time, wanting to follow a system. Well, the creatives, <laughs> they are not high in either of those categories. So I call right. them low, low. And then the third column is your ability to quick start, to jump in. Um, so if you're high in that third column, like you want to jump in, you're probably an entrepreneur. You're like, let's do this. Let's risk. Let's try this thing. And then the fourth column is implementer, which it just means tangibles and working with your hands. In my world, that fourth column just doesn't matter as much. So what I always say is I like to work with low, low highs. So that means they're not pursuing details. They're not super systematized, but they love to jump in. So in these other groups, I started noticing they would have a, a name tag on with their Colby score. And I realized that my favorite people are low, low highs. And so I've started coaching them because I'm solving a very specific problem is that they don't like systems. They don't have them set up. They know they want them. They know they need them, but they cannot figure out how to systematize things. They feel a lot of shame too. They're like, if I would just get more organized, if I could just get my act together, you know, if I, if I would just be more disciplined, then this would be successful. And what I tell them is actually, no, if you would get a VA, if you would get a left brain buddy, if you would get somebody to offload the tasks, tasks that you kind of suck at, you actually will be more successful. If you spend the majority of your time at what you're really naturally good at and probably being the visionary, being the creative, solving the needs, if you stay high level and let those details go to somebody else, your business is going to expand. It's going to grow. So that's what I focus on coaching on. So it's a very specific need. And then they find each other and they're like, oh my gosh, you're like me. And a lot of times we're all married to people not like us. So then we're able to relate <laughs> about that too, right? And then my husband can come in and go, let me explain what your spouse is thinking or feeling. And here's how you can talk to them. Here's some translations. Here's some phrases. So like one thing I'll always say to my husband, I'll go, hey, attention, undeveloped idea here. And that's his preface to know. I'm not actually saying we're going to do this. I just thought of it in the shower. And when by, <laughs> by prefacing undeveloped idea, he doesn't start with this whole plan and buy a new URL and launch a new business because he'll do that. And I'm like, I was just throwing spaghetti at the wall. And he's thinking, why? Why would you throw spaghetti at a wall? Like, let's have a plan. But we've learned this language to relate to each other. Undeveloped idea. And then he'll be like, can you let me know when I am supposed to do stuff? And so then I literally have said, unless you have a notebook at the kitchen table, we are not actually making a plan. So then sometimes I'll say to him, hey, can we meet at the table? He's like, can I bring a notebook? I'm like, yes, you can. And oh, that's when nice. we actually map out plans. And that's when he can run with it. And that's where he's gifted. So teaching my coaching clients that, teaching them these skills, these words, these techniques is literally like saving marriages. No kidding. Like it really is. So we're growing businesses. We're saving marriages. We're helping them be better parents. Um, and I think that is our specific niche, you know, and it makes sense because I do naturally attract music schools because I own one, but theater schools or educational tutors or photographers or artists, those guys are all my low, low highs. I, I love it. It's funny. You mentioned that the, the big idea and everything. And, um, and my girlfriend, I've been with her for four years and, uh, sometimes I come at it with, I'm so excited about the idea. I have no idea how to do it. <laughs> yep. That's pretty much how I, I always <laughs> yep. am. And I'm just like, I'll figure it out. Yep. And it puts a lot of stress on her Like we, we don't always work on things together, but she does support me in a lot of different ways. And so she's like, uh, and she wants to go, how are we going to do yep. it? And it freaks her out. So I actually, it's funny because I've been talking about this a lot more recently. Funny you brought it up and I'm like, all right, this is the game plan. We don't have to do this right now, but this nope. is something that I'm thinking about. Exactly. And, and so it, it does help understanding the language exactly. is super important. Exactly. So good. Um, so you talk a lot about the systems and I was just wondering, I mean, like systems are obviously extremely powerful, but what's your favorite system that you use almost on a daily basis? I use Todoist every single day. It helps me keep on track. I just click the little button that says today and it reminds me what I'm supposed to be doing. And, you know, I can set tasks for myself. I can have recurring tasks and then my team members can assign tasks to me. So that's awesome. Use um, Slack every day. 
Uh, I resisted Slack at first. I didn't really get it. Now I do. Keeps things organized, just different channels, different topics, different people that are involved in certain projects. So I love that. Um, Evernote. I love, I can throw stuff in there, right? It doesn't have to be super organized, but you can search it like Google and you can even search an image. So if you ha- take a picture of something, throw it in Evernote, it will actually search the image words. I didn't, know, awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. That so that's awesome. sweet. Um, so, and I just, you know, you can be a hot mess and then organize it later. And that's kind of how I tend to do things, right? <laughs> like let's just get going and then we can organize it. So my husband's mortified by, my, <laughs> my, my Dropbox and my Evernote, but I'm like, listen, I can find it. And so it's in there and that I just need enough organization. You know, I would prefer to be super organized. I'm actually Enneagram one, if you know anything about that. So I've got a perfectionism streak in me. Um, but I also have this creative part of me warring with it. So it's like, when am I going to be creative? And when do I then perfect it? Cause if I perfect it too soon, then we don't move forward. So I can't organize it too much or we're like stuck, right? So there is a degree of just go fast, make a mess. Like like if you're doing an art project, you're gonna make a mess. You have to, you have to pull everything out and you get the paints and you get the water and you put the newspaper on the table. Creativity is messy. We have to lean into that. Let go of the perfectionism, I'm speaking to myself. Let go of it, <laughs> let yourself make a mess, let the creativity come out again, and then see, does anybody want it? Because you have a business when people wanna buy it. It's just right. an expensive hobby if no one's buying what you're creating. So keep creating, keep playing around with it, see what you can come up with, the language. I'm a huge copywriter, I love getting, just keep massaging the words, work on it until somebody goes, I want that. Okay, now you're in business. So again, technology is awesome, but we can waste a lot of time getting it just right and the website just right. And I'm not quite ready. And da- no, 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 just get started. Honestly, get a client. Get a client however you can. Then you learn. And once you're making money, then you can just keep duplicating it. But the getting ready or getting it perfect, oh, it stalls us. It makes it you know, we, we get stuck and then we start thinking maybe I'm not good enough and maybe this isn't going to really work. And maybe I've made a big mistake. Just get out there, make some money, and then you can change it as you go. That's my motto. Yeah. And I I do love that. One thing I was going to ask though about that is that some people are so afraid Mm -hmm. of making a mistake Mm -hmm. or, I mean, maybe they've taken action and they lose money because of that action. How do you counteract that fear or, you know, maybe not trying again because of something negative happening, a negative result? What do you do or what do you tell people to do? I push through fear. So I feel the fear and do it anyway. And part of that is being raised a musician and a pianist. You're just used to sitting in line at that recital. Your stomach is going in knots. Your hands are clammy. You're freaked out. And you got to go up there and do it anyway. Because when you conquer that fear and you play that piano piece, even if you messed up and the whole audience claps and you bow and you know you're done, you're like, I did it. And I got trained to do things scared. And I'm so glad for that training. Like my body feels fear and I just go do it anyway. Fear doesn't mean stop. I think a lot of people, fear is an alert system to like warning, warning, stop, back up. But I never learned that (laughs) because as a performer, like you just have to go do it anyway. You know, and I was in theater productions and you just feel the fear and you do it. So I'm so grateful for that as an entrepreneur. But I think what you're asking too is what if you failed? Well, great. You just learned. Now you're not coming from inexperience. You're coming from experience. Like you aren't a beginner. You have knowledge of what didn't, didn't work. Basically just plan on failing over and over and over. That is not even a question. It's what do you do with that failure? Now, if you wasted a lot of money, I never have. I'm going to be honest. Like I have tried to do things as low key as possible, like teach piano lessons in my mom's living room. There's no big lease I signed. There's no big loan I took out. So how can you do things in your business like low budget, right? How can you go make money somehow anyway and reinvest it in your business? Um, The book Profit First is a good place to start too. I've always taken some money, even if it's not been very much. I really believe like make money, then you have a business, then you can do the fancier stuff. Um, and I don't know the people that, you know, that you regularly talk to, but I just, I'm just afraid that a lot of people think having a business means starting out with a huge lump sum of money. 
I don't think that's true. I mean, you push back, you tell me, but I just think, how can we just go find clients? What can you do? Do anything. So my favorite motto is do what you can with what you have, where you are. So what do you have right now? What's your ability? What's your gift? What's your background? What skill? And I tend to work with service-based people, right? So, because you could service-base anything. I could lose my music school tomorrow and I will think of something to serve people that will pay me, right? It's just, to me, it's it's like more black and white. Like, just go make money. <laughs> I don't right. know. And if you fail, just try again. I don't know. That's what I think. Well, I, it's funny because I think it was in the four-hour work week where he talked about selling Hawaiian shirts. He yep. didn't have Hawaiian shirts. And then he just said, sorry, they're on back order. Yeah. And like, then started a business. <laughs> yes. And I think testing whether you can yes. get customers to buy right. before you spend... I've heard crazy stories of people spending ten, fifty thousand dollars before they ever even got a no. chance to nope. to nope. get a customer, yep. and that's just crazy. I don't agree with that. Yep, don't. Also, do that. I I have to mention because it's so important is that because of your upbringing as a, a as a musician, yeah. you were forced into fear and you constantly pushed through that. I love how you apply that to entrepreneurship. But I also think it's a training because you you never, quote unquote, learned. Well, I mean, I'm sure you learned when you were a kid, but now it's just yeah. automatic to push right. through the fear. And for a lot of people out there, I think training yourself, putting yep. yourself in those positions yep. where Do you're going to have to force yourself to, yep. be, to go yep. through the fear. And that's going to make you more You know, a successful. year ago, I made topic. a motto. A, a year ago, I was like, all right, my motto is do it afraid. And whenever I would think of something that scared me, I would go do it. So this sounds really stupid, but I had never dyed my hair before. I had never gotten highlights, nothing. And I kind of prided myself on that. You know, I'm like, I'm not one of those high maintenance girls. But the thought of getting highlights terrified me. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to go do it. So I was shaking. I had a coat on and I went to hang it up at the salon and I missed the coat rack. It dropped to the ground. That's how shaking I was. And it's wow. so stupid. But I was like, what if they ruin it? What if this looks horrible? And the gal's like, how are you today? I'm like, I am so scared. She's like, what? I'm like, I've never done this before. What is it going to But I made myself do it anyway. Well, you could barely see it. But I got this high off of it. Like, I did it. I, okay, I can yeah. kind of see the highlights. So then I went back in a couple weeks. I'm like, let's do more. You know, and it was just this simple thing. But I think that's where you can start without the risking $10,000, $20,000, $50,000. What can you feel yeah. the fear and do it anyway? Again, like you said, to train yourself. And, you know, if it scares you to go to a chamber of commerce event and meet people, then do it because the risk is low, right? So mm-hmm. you gain a lot from learning through your fear, but you're not going to risk a whole lot. Like maybe you'll be embarrassed, you know, but it's not a big deal. So where can you test out? Because doing it anyway will apply to your business. Like you don't, you know what I'm saying? Like you don't have to train the fear muscle just in your business. You can train that muscle anywhere. I think that's why a lot of times people compare um, fitness and entrepreneurship. So they're taking that training. I think that's in your book too, right? Like you talk a lot about that. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I think that's awesome, but it's like, what, what can you do then? Like if, if roller skating or rollerblading scares you, well, go do it then. Because if we stay in our comfort level all the time, then I think we like it. We stay in our comfort bubble, get out of it. What else can you do? Just do it scared and you'll retrain your brain. They're like, it's going to be okay. <laughs> like we don't have wolves running after us. Like we are not in a survival <laughs> lifetime, right? Like this is not, not anymore. Yep. Not anymore. So I think we almost have to make ourselves feel like we're running, you know, and that's where back to my husband, like, if you want to get out of this apartment, you have to grow your business. Well, then, okay, that was like a survival thing for me. And I could have just decided, oh, well, I'll stay in this low income uh, apartment where I can literally smell the drugs coming from under the door with my baby son. No, that is motivation. Like, I am out of here. This is ridiculous. And so, what do I need to do? That moment, I did not ask myself what my passion is and what I would like to spend myself doing, (laughs) time doing. No, like, and I'm sorry if I'm offending people, but I don't care. I just knew people want piano lessons. Let's go get more students. You just hang up some flyers. You just tell people, I teach piano lessons, you know, and that's, or what I really did actually is I multiplied myself at that point. I just went and got another teacher. I interviewed them. I had zero students for them. Zero. And you just have to pitch it like, hey, I'll find you students. You want to come on board? When are you available? Tuesdays and Thursdays? Okay, awesome. Sit there for a minute. Then I go hang up the flyers, go talk to people, make phone calls and fill up that teacher's schedule, right? Because then I could multiply my time and make, it was only half the money, but still it was some money while they're doing the work 
I could focus on the multiplication. And that's what I've and really done every level of our business. And then you get freedom because yes. they're making money for that's you. Right. And and that's where scaling a business explodes. Exactly. Uh Jen, this has been so great. I love your passion, your drive. It's contagious. Um, And and for anybody who wants to connect with you, where can they find you online? Absolutely. So I love Facebook, uh, facebook.com forward slash Jen Hickel one. And my page is actually business, faith and family. So that's what I'm talking about over there all the time. Find me on Instagram, a little bit more behind the scenes, a little bit more uh, warm and and creative, I guess, is where my my Instagram people hang out. And that's Jen Hickel. And my website is jenhickel.com. And you can find that book, Happy Kids Growing Biz, on Amazon. Awesome. I'll definitely include all those links in the show notes. Jen, I'm really inspired by your story of success as an entrepreneur. Thank Thank you you so much for sharing it. Yeah, it was, I mean, amazing. Just you're absolutely the definition of the American dream and supporting your family is so huge. Um, But I always believe there is a next level of success. Mm -hmm. And so for you, what is that next level? Yeah, so we just recently hit seven figures and we're going to keep growing that. (laughs) Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and my coaching program for creatives is just taking off and that is my goal. All I want to do every single day is to encourage and empower creatives and break that shame off, help them come up with systems that work for their brain, that give them a creative playpen to play in. Because if you can have just enough systems that keep you on track, but don't make you feel like you are like bound to boringness, right? Then it's a win and helping them scale and grow and multiply. So my goal for 2020 this next year is to grow that program. I've got 25 clients right now. We're going for a hundred. That's where I'm headed and always looking ahead, you know, and it's hard as you're always like a goal driven person. I do have to stop and appreciate where I am. So it's fun to talk to you today too and kind of like see it through your eyes, you know, like the things we have done and the success we have made because I'm always pushing for the next level. Um, but, it's, but it's good. You know, you got to look backwards. You got to appreciate where you are and you're always looking forward. At least I am. I'm always looking forward to that next level and that's the program I'm growing right now because I love giving back. I love encouraging, inspiring, motivating creatives. Oh, I, I love it. I love that everything you're doing has just continued your success. That sounds like such a great journey. And I'm, I'm thankful that you were able to share your secrets today. Jen, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. This is so much fun. If you enjoyed the show and learned something of value, the one ask that I have is please go subscribe, whether you're on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube. And if you leave us a five-star rating or review, that absolutely helps us get our message out there. Each week, I'm going to continue to interview amazing people, and we're going to break down their tools and strategies to help get you real results. Feel free to visit the website, unleashedsuccess.com, and subscribe to our newsletter so you get updates each week. And remember, knowing is not enough. Knowledge alone is not power. Action is. Because action is the only way you're going to get the results you want in life and truly live the life of your dreams. So take some action, subscribe to the podcast today and get ready to unleash success in you.